Welcome to Flippening, the first and original podcast for full-time, professional, and institutional crypto investors. I'm your host, Clay Collins. Each week, we discuss the cryptocurrency economy, new investment strategies for maximizing returns, and stories from the front lines of financial disruption. Go to Flippening.com to join our newsletter for cryptocurrency investors and find out just why this podcast is called Flippening. Clay Collins is the CEO of Nomics. All opinions expressed by Clay and podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Nomics or any other company. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. My guest today is Troy Wong, CFO and co-founder of Neptune Dash, which he took public in January of 2018 in Canada on the TSX Venture Exchange. Neptune Dash is the first Dash masternode company, which currently runs 18 masternodes, each of which generates about 6.8 Dash per month. We'll explain what that means in a bit. I'm presenting this conversation to you as part of our attempt to broadly cover regulated businesses with cryptocurrency roots. Before we get into the interview, I want to explain just what a Dash masternode company is. In order to do this, I need to first explain one, what Dash is, and two, what a masternode is. Dash is currently the 13th highest ranked cryptocurrency with a market capitalization of just over $3 billion. Dash is a fork of Bitcoin with a proof of work consensus mechanism, but the blockchain also allows masternodes to earn a portion of each block reward. We'll include a link in the show notes that describes Dash mining in more detail. This is an interesting episode because there's no direct analogies to Neptune Dash's business model in the traditional financial world. Sure, Neptune Dash reminds us of -of proof-of-stake and proof-of-work mining businesses with some characteristics of direct exposure investment vehicles like the Bitcoin Investment Trust, but there's nothing else like this business model around. In this episode, we discuss one, the interesting origin story of Neptune Dash, two, a review of how a Dash masternode business works, three, why Troy and his co-founders decided to start a masternode business versus other options like starting a fund. Four, why Neptune Dash's stock is in some ways similar to an ETF product. Five, why Troy decided to run Dash masternodes instead of masternodes on the new economy movement or proof of stake mining with a project like Decred. Six, whether Neptune Dash reinvests 100% of their earned Dash into other masternodes versus diversifying their earnings. Seven, whether or not the company plans to pay out dividends. Eight, why the company doesn't vote on Dash governance issues. Nine, why taking a venture company public is similar to running an ICO, and 10, Troy's biggest challenges and headaches. We also discuss why Neptune Dash's stock price is trading at a premium to the underlying value of the Dash assets they own. Please enjoy my interview with Troy Wong of Neptune Dash. So Troy, tell me, how did you come upon the idea for Neptune Dash and what is the origin of the business? Neptune Dash Technologies Core was started on October 31st of 2017. And I co-founded the company with Kale Moody, who's the CEO of the company. And we noticed a need in the marketplace to create a public operating company that exclusively invests in the masternode ecosystem. Right now, in Canadian public markets, there's a sort of huge demand right now for public mining companies. And the general population hasn't yet gravitated towards masternodes as an asset class. And so as we dug deeper into the possibility of investing in a masternode company, we realized this is something that the public really needed. Why did you decide to do this as a business versus perhaps starting a fund? So there's a couple of reasons. We're not a fund primarily because Canadian securities laws actually prohibits any publicly traded cryptocurrency fund. And the same actually goes towards the US as well. So many people actually look at Grayscale and the public vehicles that they're building, most notably the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. But what people don't realize is like the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust and the other vehicles that Grayscale has built actually trade on an exchange called the OTCQX. So it's actually not a, what I would say, fully regulated exchange as we would understand it. The OTCQX is technically what's called like the pink sheets or over the counter. And really what the OTCQX has done is found a very clever way to automate 
the buying and selling of private company shares. So for us, it was very, very clear that from a regulatory perspective, you know, we wouldn't be able to take the position where we could take a cryptocurrency fund public. And so we created a public company that has operations that allows us basically to keep 95% of our non-cash assets in digital currencies. So from an investment perspective, it's a pure play digital currency exposure vehicle. And because we operate masternodes, we earn masternode revenue each month. What was really compelling from an investment perspective on the Dash blockchain is how high the yield is, which right now is about 8.5% annually. So not only do you get from an investor the ability to basically hold and invest these cryptocurrencies, you're earning a nice yield as well. So do you see Neptune Dash as primarily solving a problem for investors that are looking to get exposure to cryptocurrency markets? Or is that just one of the benefits and the other is that you're solving a real problem for users of the blockchain? I think it solves both aspects. When Kale and I started Neptune Dash, we really viewed cryptocurrencies as global commodities, right? I come from a traditional mining background where we look at gold, copper, silver, and zinc, and they have different investment fundamentals. And the same is to be said for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Dash, and Bitcoin Cash, right? And ultimately, if these blockchains are going to scale globally and have trillions of dollars in market value, one of the only ways to do that is to have institutional investment come in and begin to invest. And so the most liquid and obvious example to allow the public to invest in these asset classes and commodities is in public markets, which is exactly why we created Neptune Dash. Now, it's interesting that you describe yourself as a masternode company. There's a lot of other ways you could potentially describe yourself. You could have described yourself as a stake mining company. You could perhaps, it'd be a stretch, but call yourself you know, a value-added custodian, although you're just a custodian for yourself. Why do you identify first and foremost as a masternode company? Well, I, I mean, I think that the Dash blockchain is a really good job of demonstrating that the masternode model in the sense that you we operate low-cost hardware and we take a thousand Dash digital currency tokens and, and, and collateralize them on the blockchain and actually link our tokens via software and internet protocol to our hardware, right? And when you link those two components, it's what's known as a master node, which really is the core of our business. So if we were to call ourselves a proof-of-stake mining company, that suggests that like Dash is actually a proof-of-stake blockchain, which is not, right? So what, what's interesting about Dash is that it's actually a hybrid of the two in the sense that they use proof-of-work to gain consensus, but they allow master nodes or a staking model to basically explore alternative governance mechanisms that we find quite attractive. And to also validate instant transactions. Yeah, so so the Dash master nodes primarily serve three functions on the Dash blockchain. One of them is instant transactions, which you alluded to earlier. The second one is what's called the private send feature. It's really a, a coin mixing feature to increase fungibility on the blockchain such that a single Dash coin can actually be traced back through the full history of its operating life since the Genesis block, which we think is important. And privacy is a really important characteristic for our currency. And then the third, which is the most compelling, is the governance or the masternode voting feature, which you know I'm, I'm looking forward to, to talking to you about because the governance feature allows decentralized stakeholders all around the world in real time to instantly gain governance consensus and actually act on it in real time, right? And it really is a breakthrough in corporate governance that we haven't seen in modern capital markets. What do you think is the best analog to being a masternode in the traditional financial world? Or do you think one exists? That's a good question. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard that before. Like, What would a masternode most compare itself to. I don't know if there is a comparison other than you know, simple, traditional 
one common share, one vote, so to speak, in terms of in global liquid public markets, which was really, really good for 100 years ago, where the concept of actually taking a company and dividing it up into little pieces of ownership on pieces of paper and trading it around on Wall Street was very novel at the time. Now people just trade these pieces of paper around like it's normal. But 100 years ago, it would have been very, very challenging to sort of wrap your head around. But the problem with the current sort of common share structure, if you will, is the governance model in place in the sense that if I actually want to enact change as a shareholder, it's enormously expensive in terms of I have to hire very, very expensive lawyers to fight various proxy battles, potentially. I need to accumulate a large common share position in the public company that I'm looking to actually enact change. And thirdly, and most importantly, I have no idea what my other common shareholders actually think. Where allowing for a masternode voting system where any masternode can stake on the network and effectively be known as a trusted actor and then can actively participate, I know in real time what the other masternode holders think on any given topic. And so I think that as these blockchains get built out, this type of decentralized governance model is really going to resonate with people. It's going to make a lot more sense. And we're going to see a shift from public companies you know, tokenizing their common shares and somehow being able to collateralize them on a blockchain or some sort of masternode and allow for the sort of live streaming active voting structure that's currently in place on the Dash blockchain. Maybe another way of kind of getting at this is exploring where your influences lie or what models you look to. So when you were thinking about starting this business and you were perhaps pitching this to co-founders or investors, did you make reference to another business? You know, like when you were doing financial modeling, is there another public company you looked at? Where did you draw influence from? Most of our investors in our initial capital raise are institutional investors varying in various levels of sophistication. And so many of them may not know what a, a masternode is. And so I had to basically explain it to them. And the way that I explained it and the way that I understand it is that Neptune Dash is most comparable to an ETF product in the sense that you have a public vehicle or a publicly traded company that holds a massive amount of digital currency on its balance sheet, right? such that the value of the company will rise and fall with the underlying commodity price, in our case, the Dash blockchain, right? And the bonus really is that we can actually take these tokens, collateralize them on the blockchain, use them for a productive use, and actually earn more tokens over time, such that the earnings that we earn from pledging these tokens negates out our operating costs as a result of running the company. Whereas like most ETFs, traditional capital markets, they don't have such a high yield because their assets actually aren't used for anything productive. So if you were to buy a gold ETF, the gold just sits in the vault. Whereas for us, we're purchasing these tokens, actually using them for a productive purpose on the blockchain, and we're you know rewarded handsomely for that. So the ETF comparison made a lot of sense with our investors. Dash is in your name. There are other hybrid proof-of-work, proof-of-stake, blockchains like Decred, I believe it's pronounced PIVX, and I believe NIM, the new economy movement, also has masternodes. Do you see yourself saying primarily Dash-based, or do you have plans to extend what you do into other blockchain projects? Yeah. So, I mean, when we looked at Neptune Dash, we started evaluating all of the other masternodes blockchains at the time and came up to the conclusion that at the time, which was October 31st, it made sense to specialize in Dash because of its large market cap, its global trading liquidity, and its high trading volumes relative to the other mass node blockchains that are actually considerably smaller than Dash, right? And also, you know, the other consideration was this idea that we're actually going out to the open market and pitching to investors so we wanted to create a, a very, very simple vehicle that made the most sense. And when you start including multiple blockchains of questionable liquidity, of questionable valuation, and then trying to explain like the various characteristics 
to a, a relatively unsophisticated investors, let's say, it just became you know very challenging and, and, and convoluted and didn't make much sense. So getting Neptune Dash launched successfully, I think we appropriately chose like the largest mass node blockchain that we could. And then the, the more that we actually researched Dash as a blockchain, we realized, wow, there's actually a lot going on under the hood of this DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, in the sense that they have a prolific CEO and Ryan Taylor, who is an ex-McKinsey alumni and doing a really great job to tackle a lot of the Dash DAO sort of operational issues. You still have Evan Duffield, who's a, a prolific founder, who is still sort of active in the Dash community and working very, very hard to work and spending a lot of his time sort of studying and trying to solve the Dash blockchain scaling issue. And so we looked at Dash and we thought, wow, we can really build an entire business around this particular blockchain. And, and it makes a lot of sense. Referring back to your original question, which was, you know, do you see us actually moving into other blockchains potentially? The company issued a news release two weeks ago that we are going to be incubating Neptune Stake, which is what we like to think as a proof of stake validation business, where we are contributing an undefined amount of capital to purchase and invest in proof of stake coins, where we will be purchasing them, staking them on the blockchain and earning revenues and rebalancing our proof of stake portfolio over time. And the plan with that business is to spin it out into a separate public company identified as proof of stake. Interesting. Now, I know the new economy movement as of today, and this fluctuates a lot, has a slightly higher market cap than Dash and a bit less volume. Did you look at the new economy movement and possibly running a master node there as well? And what were your conclusions? Yeah, we reviewed the new economy movement. That's definitely a coin that we were going to incubate within Neptune Stake. If you take a look at a little bit more detail in NAM, you'll see that the majority of the trading volume exists on a single exchange, which doesn't give us a lot of comfort there. The second thing is that the new economy move movement doesn't have a high enough yield relative to the Dash blockchain. Dash's yield for mass node is about 8.5%, and NEMS is about 4%. Do you reinvest 100% of the Dash that you receive back into master nodes, or do you diversify into other blockchains, or do you find other ways of reinvesting that capital, or is it only back into master nodes? So the goal here right now is to earn as much Dash as possible and just keep it on our balance sheet and build more master nodes. So it's a very, very simple model. We've been approached with a number of alternative investment opportunities. There's a number of other companies that are going public in this space, and they're trying to take on numerous projects all at once. But you have to remember that with every sort of investment decision into an alternative non-master node project, we have to weigh sort of the risk and rewards associated with just actually just keeping Dash and buying more astronauts, right? So if the Dash price can continue going up and go up 3, 4, 5, 10x, then our balance sheet just went up 3, 4, 5, 10x, which is an, an astronomical win for the company, the company's balance sheet and, and return for shareholders versus actually having to go out and actually invest and build an operating business that is likely not going to go up 4, 5, or 10x you know, any time in the near future. So uh, although holding such a large amount of Dash digital currency tokens in our balance sheet can be quite risky from an investment perspective, we think that's why our investors want that type of exposure. Does the company plan on paying out dividends or is 100% of the return that investors will see from investing in your stock come from the appreciation and the resale value of the stock itself? We only raised $23 million Canadian. So we're still a, a small sort of high growth technology company. As cryptocurrency markets mature and trillions of dollars enter the space, you know, we expect that a portion of that capital to flow into the Dash blockchain. Therefore, the Dash price will increase materially and we can afford to start paying out dividends. But for now, we're, we're still a very small company. This is considered a venture level stock on the TSX Venture Exchange. And so we would need to get quite a bit larger in order to sustain the type of cash flow required to pay out dividends to shareholders. But that's absolutely something that we would consider and anticipate doing once we grow large enough. 
Very cool. Let's step back a little bit and explore the 20,000 foot view on masternodes and the masternode business. So just kind of taking it from the top, could you describe what a masternode does, the value that it provides the network, and what is involved in creating a, a masternode from scratch? A masternode represents what's called a, a level two scaling solution, which is a form of blockchain architecture that allows one or a user to actually stake currency on the network and link it to a node, which is a server on a blockchain that processes transactions on a blockchain. And when you link nodes and tokens together, you're identified as a trusted actor on the network, and then you can build upon it and build using advanced functionality, right? So governance functions is the largest, most well-known sort of application of master nodes because it evolved out of, I guess, the Bitcoin scaling debate that took over two and a half years to resolve, which is this idea of what do the users actually think and how should they actually scale? And masternodes facilitate this voting model where masternodes can basically actively vote on whatever they want in the community. It allows a decentralized set of users to obtain decentralized governance consensus in real time, which to me is sort of like the fundamental breakthrough in this type of technology. Got it. So if someone wants to start a master node, they essentially lock up a thousand dash and assign it to that node. And it gives them the ability to vote on governance issues. And as you said before, confirm instant transactions. And the third feature is the private send. So facilitates private transactions on the blockchain. Is that, do I have that right? Yep. And potentially there will be other applications as well that can be built on top of the blockchain. But those are the three sort of like most well-known and used. Can you describe for us how a masternode gets paid and when and how much it gets paid and how all that is determined? Just like Bitcoin has its own sort of defined inflation structure of how Bitcoin enters the ecosystem through being mined, Dash has a similar protocol where the block reward is actually split between miners, masternodes, and treasury. And so the way that a masternode holder would get paid is that you have this block reward or a certain amount of dash that's entering the ecosystem with each block that's being solved. And an algorithm basically calculates and allocates the block reward to each masternode in a queue-like format such that If I have a masternode, I'm plugged into the internet and that I've been sort of contributing to the network and servicing the network for a set period of time, then algorithmically, I'll get my masternode payout in line. And right now, the current yield for a single masternode on the Dash blockchain is about 6.8 Dash per month. I guess digging into the governance aspect of all of this a little bit more, What are some of the governance issues that you voted on recently? And how do you decide as a company how you're going to vote? So Neptune Dash was actually taking the position not to actively participate in masternode voting protocols. We think that it puts us in a a bit of a tricky position with our shareholders, given that the masternodes are the ownership of the shareholders. And we effectively have control over these mass node assets as a board. And so it'd be a little bit centralized if the board was sort of actively voting on the various treasury proposals on the Dash blockchain. I did do a Reddit AMA recently and got a lot of feedback from the Dash community that actually wants us to start actively voting on these treasury proposals because they thought that, well, there's a number of really good arguments. They thought that, you know, it's kind of a waste for us to operate these masternodes and actually not be actively contributing in the form of voting. And some people just really liked the concept of Neptune Dash and thought that, you know, whatever outcome that we voted on would be sort of like well thought out and, and well appreciated. So, I mean, that was really great to sort of hear those comments from the Reddit community. But right now, we're in a position where we'd rather take a passive view 
and sort of see how things go. If we receive a bit more comments from the Dash community that they really want us to actively vote, then we'll have to figure out a way to put in place a, a voting mechanism that works for our shareholders. Does the return that masternodes receive for each block diminish as more masternodes spring up or does it stay consistent year over year? Exactly, right? That's exactly how you want to think of it. So right now there's about 4,800 Dash masternodes that are plugged into the Dash blockchain and there's a finite or set block reward, right? That's split up over an ever-expanding or ever-decreasing number of Dash mass node ecosystem participants. So right now we're actually seeing more masternodes enter the Dash blockchain. So the actual net payout per masternode is slightly reducing over time. I know that Dash will someday stop mining new coins. How will Dash masternodes make money then? Will it be based on a percentage of the transaction fees or will masternodes stop receiving payouts at that time? So the good news is the Dash blockchain has a, a similar inflation rate to Bitcoin, whereby the last, I guess, coin that will be mined and distributed in the block award is like over 100 years away. So that's not really a problem that we're really looking at right now. And I like it when everyone asks these theoretical questions. And, and basically, it's, well, it's actually in 100 years that the block award runs out. The other response is that like, because we actually have a mass node governance system in place where those individuals who have actually invested in the blockchain via ownership of assets are the ones that can actively provide suggestions and come to scaling protocols very, very quickly, which is the whole point of a blockchain. And so the way I like to explain it is that if we run into sort of like these issues about how to actually pay out master nodes or how to actually scale the Dash blockchain, those issues can just be actively voted on, the majority rules, and then we as a blockchain can move on. So safe to say that if a proposal were to emerge proposing that master nodes pay out increase or, or stay constant, like you, I guess, as a fiduciary would be somewhat obligated to vote on that? We would definitely vote on that. We have received the question before, like, would you vote on increasing your, your own payout? <laughs> but I, I think that mass node holders are, are quite intelligent in the sense that there's no free lunch in economics. So you can vote to increase, you know, the payout to the mass nodes, but that's at the cost of another decentralized stakeholder in the ecosystem. In our case, you know, the treasury system and our miners which hurts the blockchain as a whole, right? I think we've struck a good balance between payments to miners, mash node holders, and the Dash DAO. That makes a lot of sense. And we don't see a reason to change it unless there would be some sort of like massive fire or red flag that need to be addressed. And another aspect of this is, you know, part of being a fiduciary is taking into consideration how much Dash you actually hold. So whatever you would be doing you're more incentivized to ensure that the value of the dash you hold increases than you are to, you know, perhaps increase the annual yield from like 8% to 12%, right? There's a lot more in the bank than there is coming as a result of a vote. Absolutely. And I think you sparked a really good comparison here, Clay, which is that like blockchains really are ecosystems with all of these economic sort of checks and balances in place to ensure that if people vote within their own interest, there is a real economic cost to that outcome in the short and long term, right? So in our case, if the mass node holders vote to increase a larger portion of the block reward, well, then potentially the Dash price could go down because the Dash price is less secure because less miners are securing the chain and we're potentially able to be hacked, for example, Right or a 51% attack on the blockchain, right? So what I like about blockchains in general is this idea of a decentralized ecosystem of a number of different participants all around the world that are coming together, working on their own self-interest. And the outcome of what you see in the sense of a functional blockchain and a token price is sort of a perfect symmetry of all those stakeholders coming together. What do your models suggest the decrease in the 
reward of master nodes over time will be, right? So even though more Dash are going to be mined for the foreseeable future, the number of Dash mined each year will decrease. What do your models say, for example, the ROI on a master node will be potentially 10 years out? Yeah, so it always very difficult to model out forecast returns, <laughs> given the difficulty of forecasting price, right? But what we can say is, like we sort of modeled out the returns based off sort of current number of masternodes in the Dash blockchain, as well as like what the expected payout would be in Dash. And so right now we're looking at a decline of the Dash block reward paid out to miners and masternode holders of about 7% a year, which is relatively low given the expected increase in price of Dash itself. How is the performance of your stock bin as a publicly traded company? Has it roughly tracked the price of Dash or has it done something different? Our stock price has done relatively well, all things given being considered in the market. So we raised money and closed the financing round. I believe the money was deposited in our bank on December 22nd, which was the peak of of the cryptocurrency markets. If you remember, we went public on, on January 22nd of 2018. And the prices were actually quite a a lot lower. And the prices have continued to decline over time. And that has definitely affected our stock price, as well as the stock price of other Canadian public companies that are trading relative to blockchain cryptocurrency prices. And so we, we performed in line with our peers. And it hasn't yet sort of exactly mirrored like the Dash price, the way that you would expect. What I've noticed with taking a venture company public is that it is kind of similar to an ICO in the sense that you have you know a very small company with a small number of shareholders traded on a public exchange with only a highly speculative investor wanting to invest, very similar to an ICO. And so you have a, a tremendous amount of short-term speculation in these types of cryptocurrency or I say junior companies. And Neptune Dash stock price is no different than any other company in this space, given its size. But we expect that as more capital you know, comes into the space, and as the market matures, the stock price will trade more in line with the underlying digital currency token price. But for right now, The majority of investors out there that are investing in these blockchain companies are relatively unsophisticated. And so they're just buying the company because it's blockchain. They really don't have much of an idea of what the difference between a masternode company would be, a mining company would be, what a fund would be, or what a cryptocurrency exchange would be. And so we're, we're, we're very, very early days from a public markets perspective of investing in, in, in cryptocurrency companies. And I expect it will take anywhere from three to five years before the market catches up and really, really knows how to understand these assets and how to value them. If a value investor were looking at your stock and the value of the business right now, would they find that the value of Neptune Dash currently is it valued at more than the value of the owned Dash at today's prices or less? So right now, if you look at the, the net asset value of the total Dash that the company owns relative to the market capitalization of the company, we are trading at a substantial premium, which is a win for the company, if you will. But quite frankly, we expected that to occur given the lack of quality blockchain companies in the space. The most comparable publicly traded entity that's most cited is is the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. There's been a number of articles in the media published that the premium to NAV of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is sort of massively overvalued. I mean, sometimes they trade at as low as 0% premium, but as high as like 80% or even more in some cases. And so I, I think that really reflects the underlying nature of the lack of quality sort of investable products in public markets, as well as the level of sophistication of the users that are basically investing in the space. But then as you already know, these companies trade the way they trade. There's a number of sort of 
external factors affecting the price, such as short-term traders, momentum traders, high-frequency trading that can affect stock prices that go beyond sort of like a net asset value calculation. And so that's kind of why I believe we're going to you know, expect to continue to see these blockchain companies trade at substantial premiums to their book value. I don't know what kind of analytics you have about the owners of your stock, but can you speak to the percentage of your investors that are outside of Canada versus inside? Is, have you found that there's been international demand for what you provide in terms of exposure to the asset class? When we closed the financing round, we engaged a, a local investment bank here in Canada and exclusively only raised Canada from sophisticated institutions in Canada. So by definition, no capital was actually raised in the United States or anywhere globally. And so the only way an external investor would be able to purchase shares in our company was if their specific broker dealer in the region that they lived allow them to purchase stocks on the, the TSX Venture Exchange. Some brokers allow for that type of access and some don't. When Neptune Dash went public, it was very well promoted on, on Reddit and the Dash community. And there were a number of individuals that reached out to us in the US that wanted to invest in the company, but there was no easy way to do it. And eventually, we identified a broker down in the US that does allow for the purchase of our common shares, despite it not being locally traded in the US. But it does take some time and effort to figure that out. I know in the United States, going public is a big deal. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. You might as well just burn about $20 million per year just to be public. What was the experience like going public in Canada? What are the reporting requirements? What's the regulatory overhead? What does it take in terms of capital time effort to go public and to stay public in Canada? Taking a company public in Canada, I've never done it in the US, but we've engaged legal counsel down there. And we know a number of people that have taken companies public. And, and, and from what I can tell, it's, it's much easier and lower cost in Canada. Canada has built out a nice venture market that allows for venture style companies to go public and operate at low cost. And it's also a highly speculative environment too, which is really, really great for the local economy because different types of unique businesses that perhaps might not be listed anywhere else globally can actually find the type of investor that they want, as well as the exchange and regulatory environment and the operating costs of professional service providers that allow them to list. So for us to go public and stay public, it's relatively inexpensive. I'm not going to talk to specifics about how much it costs, because that's disclosed in our financial statements. But it's not unduly onerous or can take like a significant amount of time to go public. For us, the company was incorporated on October 31st, and we were a publicly traded company on January 22nd, I believe. So within a very, very short period of time, we actually formed the company and we're actually trading in Canadian public markets. We think that that's part of the appeal of a number of blockchain companies going public in Canada, which I think your viewers will find you know, perhaps the most interesting. From the research that I've done, Canada really is basically the only place where these blockchain companies are going public right now. And there's been a large number of interest from larger American players seeking a public listing on a Canadian exchange. The most well-known individual that I can cite right now is Mike Novogratz. He actually purchased a private company out of Vancouver called First Coin Capital and is listing First Coin Capital via what's called a reverse takeover on the TSX Venture Exchange. And my understanding is he's raised approximately 300 million Canadian dollars from Canadian investors as well as international investors. But a $300 million raise for you know a Mike Novogratz backed cryptocurrency company is an amazing feat. And he did it in Canada. And there's a reason why he came to Canada was because you have like a really great new venture market here, as well as legal and operational structure that makes a lot of sense. I heard he's aiming to start the Goldman of crypto. Do you know what the nature of that company is? 
I actually haven't seen the slide deck with what he's doing, but I'm sure that whatever Mike does, it's going to be really, really interesting. My understanding is there's a number of different business units that he plans on launching, one of them being an actual trading business where they trade cryptocurrencies, another of them being almost like a merchant bank where they provide financing and go public services to ICOs and, and other blockchains. That's really the, the extent of my knowledge on that one. Let's talk a little bit about company operations. What does it take to run a masternode business? How many employees do you have? What skills and skill sets do you need to have within the business to operate on a daily basis? At Neptune Dash, we have four full-time employees. So there's myself, who's the CFO. There's my co-founder, Kale Moody, who's the president and CEO. We have a, a really great chief operating officer, and we have an investor relations person. What's really good about operating a mash node company is a lot of the operational work up front is done in just setting up the master nodes. And so we spend a significant amount of time learning technology, learning how to custody the assets, setting up all the processes so that we can safely custody the assets in a public company environment, automating the collateralization process so that we can stake assets on the Dash blockchain, know what addresses that the currencies are staked at, as well as automate the server process so that our servers are constantly attached to and hooked up to the Dash blockchain so that we don't lose any of the Dash Mashnode payouts. And once you set up that full process from cradle to grave, it's a bit of a plug and play aspect. But over at Neptune, you know, we're constantly trying to innovate and do different things. And so right now I'm working on a company called Neptune Stake, which I talked about earlier. So we're setting up the process and our internal controls to set up all of those staking assets and monitor them as well. A lot of the business is actually investor relations and promotions. So we really spend a lot of time working with investors and educating them on Dash, on cryptocurrencies and masternode assets in general. That really has been the largest challenge right now given how early we are in the public markets cryptocurrency investing space. Because you have to remember the nature of this venture market is not normal sort of sophisticated ICO investors that you see on Reddit and Telegram groups potentially. You really have people who don't know the difference between potentially Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin, and all blockchains are the same to them. And trying to go to an unsophisticated investor and actually properly break it down and explain to them the differences in technology and the value propositions that we bring. So I spend a lot of my time doing that type of work, which I think is actually really, really important, you know, just broadly as a whole for people to learn about this technology. It's absolutely invaluable work, especially for Dash. I remember when I was at Coindesk's Consensus Invest event, and at one point, the speaker surveyed the audience and asked them what crypto assets they held. And a good percentage of them said that they held Zcash and Ethereum. And then the speaker said, what, you know, when you say you hold Ethereum, do you mean Ethereum or Ethereum Classic? And the majority of the audience said that they held Ethereum Classic. And I've got to believe that has to do with the Zcash and Ethereum Classic investment trusts and the education that Grayscale has done around those products to institutional investors. So I think it can have a really big impact in terms of educating a a core group of people or a a new group of people to the space. Absolutely, right? So I mean, for us as like, you know, cryptocurrency enthusiasts, like, I mean, for me, I really fell down the rabbit hole. Like I really spend all of my time reading about cryptocurrencies, assets and the technology and the different blockchains. And the reality is most people aren't going to do that. And it's completely foreign to them. And so the education process is going to take time. I think that for the broader market to understand it, it's going to take you know, several years. But you know, hopefully we can do our part you know, over at Neptune Dash to sort of further the mission of cryptocurrencies by educating the broader market as a whole. In terms of operations, again, what is your biggest challenge? Is it, is it hiring? Is it identifying technical talent? Is it custodianship? What do you find yourself wringing your hands about most frequently? The challenging part right now is the promotions and marketing this business and trying to actually 
properly deploy marketing dollars in the most economic and high ROI return possible. Once you start a public company, there is a number of different avenues for marketing and they all come with very, very high price checks. And so, you know, knowing how to deploy those marketing dollars in a way that makes sense is something that's very, very challenging because ultimately, as I alluded to earlier, like taking a company public kind of is like doing an ICO. And so, you know, what drives the value of an ICO is absolutely, you know, the community and underlying blockchain technology, but a lot of it is the promotions. And, you know, people can't buy your ICO if they don't know what it is. And so there's a whole aspect to, I hate to use the word promoting a public company, but just bringing general awareness to sort of the company's mission and and what the company is doing and doing it in the economic, the most economic way possible is by far sort of the largest challenge that we're facing right now. What kind of activities, you know, as a public company, are you barred from undertaking? Like, are you barred from general solicitation? What can you do and not do when it comes to marketing the business and the stock? I don't know in terms of what we can't do. I can't speak to that. I mean, in terms of the marketing initiatives that we would like to do, it's no different than any other business in the sense that we would we we have looked at starting a podcast, we've looked at creating a, a weekly newsletter, we've looked at sponsoring conferences and events in the blockchain space, both locally and internationally. You know, we've looked at writing blog articles. So like the stuff that we're looking at doing is is as very grassroots and organic related. What we haven't engaged in is any sort of speculative, you know, stock promoting or paying promoters to purchase our stock or anything like that. It's very similar to any other ICO or public company under the marketing initiatives that we're doing. For example, you wouldn't allow to take out a radio ad that says, you know, go to www.neptune dash forward slash buy our stock. <laughs> oh, I never thought about that. I mean, I, I think anything that says buy our stock is probably <laughs> probably illegal, not legal, compliant with securities laws. I'll have to check with our legal counsel on that. We could purchase a radio interview saying promoting Neptune Dash as the first Dash Mash node company and inviting investors to come to one of our events. What's your biggest worry right now? When you disclose vulnerabilities, what do you put as first and foremost on that list? Our company by design is pure play cryptocurrency exposure, specifically the Dash blockchain. So, you know, the underlying cryptocurrency commodity price really is a a double-edged sword in the sense that when things are good, they're really, really good. And when things are bad, they could potentially be very, very bad. When we can see our balance sheet, you know, go up three or four or five X in value, and then it can shrink 60% in value as well. Whereas, you know, compared to sort of cryptocurrency miners, the reality is, is that investors don't view them the same way because most of their capital assets just go to look really just a data center and hardware. And so their balance sheet isn't expanding and contracting in value at the same rate that our business would. But that being said, we think there's a much higher rate of return owning the token and commodity itself versus buying mining hardware. And so as long as the Dash ecosystem and the Dash blockchain continues to go up, then we're going to be quite happy with you know the returns on our balance sheet. Something I saw on your deck was that a masternode business offers direct exposure versus a mining company, which offers indirect exposure. Is that because a masternode business has to own so much of a cryptocurrency in order to operate, whereas a mining company can just immediately get liquidity on the Bitcoin that they've mined and the crypto asset isn't required to operate? There's a couple of reasons why you know, we think investing in masternodes is a bit simpler than investing in mining like traditional proof of work mining operations. The first thing is, if you think about it from a a strictly a capital raising perspective, we're approaching investors. It's a very clear value proposition of what we're doing. We're raising capital and the majority of that capital is actually just going to go to the token itself. So there's very little sort of like operational risk associated with our management team actually having to build out a high quality data center that we think is important. The second thing is, since the majority of our assets are actually in a token today, you're buying digital currency tokens today, right? Whereas when you're investing in mining assets, if you think about it, 
you're really investing to purchase digital currency tokens sometime in the future. Because what you need to do is you need to go out, you need to raise capital, you need to purchase equipment, you need to set it up, you need to operate in a low cost operational jurisdiction, you need to operate those mining hardware profitably for a number of months and recoup all of your capital investment before you get back to square one. And then, and only then, do you actually start accumulating currency in your balance sheet the same way that we have the currency accumulate our balance sheet today. So that was meant to sort of illustrate that, that we love proof of work miners. We just wanted to point out that there are sort of fundamental technical differences associated with operating a proof of work mining company, which also include a hashing rate and difficulty adjustment that's relatively unpredictable. And so we want to just caution investors so that they know the differences between the different types of investment opportunities out there. It strikes me that what you're doing feels a lot more like a uh, passively managed versus an actively managed fund. You're not entering and exiting positions when you think the price is going to drop or rise. You're not having to worry about reinvestment into other sources of income or or diversifying across asset classes or crypto assets. It's a very kind of nice, simple business without a lot of operational overhead or complexity, which is kind of cool and refreshing. I think that's the easiest way for these types of companies to go public and trade. Ideally, every currency would have masternodes, and then we could have a Bitcoin masternode company and a Ethereum masternode company. And because it's simplistic and easy to understand, it allows for the market to quickly value them and for these companies to trade as a proxy to the price, which is the intent. And then you can raise more capital and really build out a very nice balance sheet that allows for sort of like public market capital to enter the cryptocurrency space. Because right now, it's just very, very difficult to do. And there's very, very little opportunity for it, which is why potentially we're seeing this decline in price because the number of outlets available to pension funds, to sovereign wealth funds, to large public companies that are mandated not to you know, take custody of their own assets, for example, to invest in cryptocurrencies. So we, we think that you know creating the simplest vehicles possible to invest in cryptocurrency assets you know, makes the most sense. And it's good for you know, cryptocurrency assets in general. Well, thank you so much for making time for our audience Troy, really appreciate it. It was a fascinating, wide-ranging conversation. So we appreciate the time and the thoughtfulness of your answers. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. That's it for this week. To sign up for our free crypto investing newsletter, listen to other episodes, or get the show notes from this episode, please visit flippening.com. I also invite you to check out the startup that funds this podcast, Nomics, spelled N-O-M-I-C-S, at nomics.com. Finally, if you got value from the show, the biggest thing you can do to help us out is to leave a five-star review with some comments and feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening and see you next week.